I'll make two quick announcements while you're getting your food and coming back here. One of them is that next meeting, next first month of a uh, first meeting in the month of April is the time to bring your QSL cards if you want to have them sent to the bureau by the club. Terry N4ZH is going to turn them in shortly after that meeting. And if you have cards that you want to have checked for DXCC or other awards, he'll be doing that at Winterfest as usual. And POH, did you have a question or are you just pointing to the ceiling? Oh, oh, sign up sheet. Don't forget to sign up. Everybody sign up. Uh, let's see, there was one more thing I was supposed to say. I forgot what it was. Memory goes, er the memory goes first and then I can't remember what goes second. Um, okay, so everybody, excuse me, you're in for a treat. I have seen a portion of this presentation done by somebody else and this is going to be even better. This is so good that it's going to be better than the boring t uh, Thursday night 10 meter net. Here is your host, AE4R. Thanks, Bill. I don't know what to say now after all that. I will say that um, it might be even more boring than the 10 meter net. But anyway, uh, uh, what we have here tonight is a, um, is a presentation that was done by Paul Harden. He's uh, NA5N, he lives in Socorro, New Mexico. He's a really good guy, which means he was in the Navy. <laughs> and um, uh, he has uh, graciously allowed our club to um, use his presentation that he made last summer to a uh, ham fest down in New Mexico. And uh, he and I have just uh, corresponded by email. He said he's given this uh, two or three more times, and he's had very good response. I hope we have. I hope I have good response tonight too. Uh, I would ask that you all hold your questions and then uh, uh, pin me with them after the after the presentation as long as you want. Okay. Let's see. This is Paul. Uh, as I said, he lives in uh, New Mexico. He served in submarines. We won't hold that against him, Ron. <laughs> uh, he worked in radio astronomy, and uh, these days he's a very avid QRP operator. What happened? Well, anything, uh, everybody here knows what happened to the Titanic. It's lying on the seabed in the North Atlantic Ocean, right? Well, on the night of April 15th, uh, uh, April 15th, uh, 1912, um, on a very dark night, uh, Titanic sideswiped an iceberg, which was like hitting a, uh, a, a hill of granite. It, uh, the impact uh, bashed in the, the hull, starting very close to the bow, over a distance of um, almost 260 feet. and the Atlantic Ocean rushed in. Well, we all know that the Titanic sank. Why did it sink? Well, the Titanic um, was not designed to be unsinkable. That was a, a, uh, something the, uh, the British press uh, said about it, but the owners and the builders never did. They did build it to uh, be watertight, uh, to have watertight integrity. They put 15 uh, bulkheads in the ship uh, uh, that's a, a kind of a metal wall from one side to the other and uh, these were like dams they weren't closed at the top the Titanic was designed to withstand four of these compartments flooding the iceberg ripped open six so before they, the uh, the Titanic was clear of the iceberg she was doomed she was going to the bottom and what happened was that as water flooded in to those four, those six compartments, the bow uh, was pulled down. Uh, water spilled over the uh, the the, the uh, uh, bulkhead farthest aft into the next compartment. It filled up, and then the process repeated until the ship filled up with water. Wireless communications is what we're really going to talk about tonight. 
not about the Titanic sinking or where it is on the bottom or any of that, that stuff. There's plenty of information on the web. It's fascinating, and I urge you to go find out more about it. But that's not what we're going to talk about tonight. Wireless communications. The Titanic had, had a wireless capability. In fact, she had state-of-the-art for the time in 1912. Uh, thanks to that wireless, over 700 people survived of the 2,200 that were aboard when she sank or when she started to sink. And that was thanks not just to wireless, but also the heroic conduct of her uh, passengers and crew. Without wireless, the ship uh, would have had no means to summon help from other ships other than uh, shooting flares, and that didn't work. We'll talk about that. Uh, and there likely would have been few, if any, survivors. Paul put this slide in. He, uh, he had the, um, the, uh, the idea that in the past, ships without wireless, um, our, our ships had gone to sea over centuries, maybe thousands of years, and not come back. They'd never been seen again. All the people that were aboard them were lost and uh, without ever being seen or heard from again. Well, that was still happening up to the end of the uh, 18th century. And even into the 19th century, it was happening. The, um, the Spanish galleons that were lost were in uh, olden times, but the Mary Celeste was uh, in 1872, a, a freighter that left uh, New York City headed for um, somewhere in the Adriatic or Italy, and um, uh, she disappeared. Uh, almost a year later, she was, uh, she was found floating derelict. Nobody was aboard. Where did those people go? No one knows. One of their boats was missing, but the ship itself was still seaworthy. What happened? Well, with wireless, those people, instead of bailing out and uh, floating desperately on the ocean, trying to do something that got them all killed, they might have been able to signal for help. But what did the ships like the Mary Celeste and the Galleons have to have before they could use wireless? Even electricity, that's right. Well, let's talk about electricity. The first ship that ever was wired for electricity was the, the small um, uh, cruise ship, SS Columbia. Uh, she, was, um, she went to sea in 1880. She had a, uh, a wireless system, or an electrical system aboard. The owner of a, um, of a big deal railroad and shipbuilding company uh, heard about uh, uh, Mr. Edison's uh, light bulbs, went to see a demonstration, and decided they would be good for his ship. So he bought four big um, uh, Edison dynamos, installed them in the ship with belts to run on the ship's propeller shaft. And um, it worked. They had guys down in the engineering plants adjusting the, uh, the voltage on the lamps whenever the, whenever the uh, uh, screw uh, or the, the shaft sped up or slowed down. But it did work. The Navy took notice of this, and by 1883, it was installing electrical systems in its ships. So soon uh, electrical systems became standard on all ships. And you've uh, already seen a picture of the Titanic with all its thousands of lights. You can see that by 1912, lighting had, lighting technology had improved immeasurably. Well, wireless didn't come along right away. We'll talk about when it did. It's a 20th century development. In 1898, a ship not unlike the Titanic in its function and size, this was a big liner, it was French, the SS La Bourgogne. She was a uh, popular liner that made the run from uh, France to uh, New York City. And um, 
1898, she was out there going really fast, as fast as she could go through thick fog. How many here have ever been in really thick fog? Fog so thick you can't see the end of your driveway. That's what she was doing. She was barreling along in the fog, no radar. She was sounding fog signals. There came other fog signals through the fog, and then suddenly a big iron sailing ship smashed into her right amidships. The sailing ship's bow was completely wrecked. A big hole opened up in the side of this ship. She keeled over. There was a huge battle on deck between crew and passengers to, get, to see who could get into the lifeboats, and she went down. Meanwhile, the sailing ship is out there in the fog somewhere. The, uh, the, the liner was, uh, was sending uh, a big whistle, and the, the sailing ship thought the passenger ship was looking for her so that the passenger ship could rescue the, the sailors. When the fog lifted a little bit, the sailors on the sailing ship saw to their horror this ship going down, and they picked up not all that many survivors for the many aboard. You say that over 700 people are aboard and only 173 were saved? Well, I urge you to read about this. This was a terrible, terrible story, disgusting and revolting about what happened on the liner, but what happened for the people that, that were saved is they just were lucky to have the sailing ship still there and able to help them get aboard. Otherwise, they would have been out there floating for who knows how long, and they might have all perished. This was before wireless. Well, here's wireless. You kind of all know the story of Marconi, right? He's uh, experimenting with trying to send signals across the Atlantic, and finally he succeeded in 1901. He started building uh, wireless stations. He set up networks to relay signals. He realized that there would be good business uh, selling wireless to, uh, to shipping companies to put on their ships. Uh, Telefunken Corporation in, uh, in Germany, how many have ever heard of them? Anyway, they set up a competing service to, uh, to, and, and stations. Uh, in 1906, about, Radio amateurs got themselves together and started putting together wireless stations. I'll talk more about that in a, in a bit. In 1907, the Marconi and, uh, and Telefunken started a subscription service for the, uh, for the shippers. They would provide operators to come aboard, equipment, and they would provide relay stations, and from those they could send messages back and forth. They could provide weather, ice warnings, what have you. In 1910, the Congress decided that, uh, that American uh, ships should have wireless capability, and so ordered. Uh, this meant that all the ships that, that touched into American ports had to have it too, so ships began to be retrofitted with wireless stations. And as Our Lady uh, Nancy once uh, told me not too long ago, that's where that's where the term radio shack came from. These shacks were built on the top side on the, on the ships, usually out of wood, and their wireless systems were set up there. Well, by 1911, over 1,000 US ships were, uh, were equipped with wireless, and, uh, and about the time the, uh, the, the RMS Olympic was launched, and the next year the Titanic, those two ships were the first to have wireless stations built as part of the ship. They were integral. They were, um, um, they were also uh, big, and I'll get to that in a, in a minute. What, by the way, does RMS stand for? Does anybody know the answer to that? Ro Royal Mail Service, right? The king ships that were fast enough to carry the mails were, uh, were designated Royal Mail ships. Okay, um, in 1912, we'll talk about this in, in a bit, uh, the, the Radio Act of 1912 
Uh, among other things, it provided for an amateur radio service. And you know about the history of the ARL. What does the ARL stand for? American Radio Relay League. Relay, 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 relay. That was wireless. Yes, sir. Closer? Okay, sorry. Okay, well, um, what was happening on land? Well, commercial service was alive and well at sea, but not on land. There was a, 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 a message relay uh, network, an infrastructure already established, and it had been since, like, before the Civil War. It was landline. Landline telegraphy. You, you, a lot of you people in here of an age that you can remember Western Union telegrams, and these, these um, uh, telephone and telegraph lines that stretched across the country, you'd have 30 or 40 wires on every pole. You see those nowadays? Nope. Anyway, but there was, there was wireless activity on land. And guess who was doing it? We were. Radio amateurs. And there were lots of us. By 1911, over 10,000. And there were um, something like 6,000 in Europe. Many radio amateurs had money. They could set up these extremely powerful trans transmitters. They could set up huge, long antennas. The ships couldn't do that. Ships couldn't. Sh that took uh, a lot of power and took a lot of wire and space. Ships didn't have that. So, uh, as as the uh, as the maritime companies and the navies of the world soon found out, they were getting a lot of interference from radio amateurs, and this was going to be a problem. Well. How did they make those signals? Spark gap. Everybody here knows about spark gap, right? Well, I didn't. I had to study up on it so, and, and figure out how these, they worked. I've been, I've been licensed since 1959, and I really didn't know how spark gaps work. Anyway, uh, this is a uh, Marconi schematic diagram. And it's, it's pretty simple if you look at it and understand what you're looking at. A, um, a, uh, um, some kind of a motor or, or inverter, or, or not inverter, but an uh, uh, alternator would, would produce large voltages and currents, which were keyed down here. And they would go through uh, transformers to step up the voltage, which they applied to the, this spark gap here, which produced what? Broadband RF noise, right? Okay, and then that went through a, a, a tuned circuit to an antenna and produced nasty sounding uh, signals uh, in, this, in this approximate radio band. You can imagine, how many here watched that movie that I asked everybody to watch? You heard spark gap signals, right? You heard how nasty they're, they're, they sounded. Well, that's what, that's what went out onto the air. This is a typical uh, early uh, radio station, a wireless station aboard a ship, about 1908. How many here have heard of the Lus Lusitania? She was famously sunk by a submarine in 1915 with the Americans aboard in a huge international incident. But she was one of the great liners. She and the Maritania were, were, were two of the great liners that plied the, uh, the Atlantic with, with huge uh, uh, luxury and lots of passengers, first, second, and third class. They were fast. They had four stacks that were all belching smoke, and they went fast. But they didn't have, they didn't go to sea with radio shacks. They were, uh, they were built later. You can see in this photograph, it looks like wood paneling. Well, that's what it was. This is the radio shack aboard 
uh, the Lusitania or the Mauritania. Those were, uh, those were Cunard Line ships. White Star came along with two, two big ships, even bigger than the Lusitania. They were the Olympic and Titanic. This is the Olympic that's uh, getting underway here. This is a photograph, an actual photograph of her wireless shack. Very nicely appointed. You can see all that modern gear there, right? The, uh, the Olympic was one of the rare ships that I'll talk about by name in this presentation that wasn't sunk by enemy action or by uh, collision. But her sister wasn't so lucky. These were the two sisters. And Paul wanted to put this in, uh, wanted uh, all of his audiences to, uh, to take note of why the ships had four funnels. They only needed three of them. They were all, only three, the first three were used to, uh, to um, uh, exhaust uh, uh, boiler gases. The fourth one was a dummy. It, it actually was a storeroom. And it was, um, it, it was uh, put on there at, by the builders to show that she was just as powerful as the Lusitania and Mauritania that had four actual working stacks. Anyway, so these ships were, um, were bigger, faster, more luxurious than the Lusitania and Mauritania. This is an actual photograph. Oops, sorry, sorry. Right here is a photograph of the, um, of the Titanic's wireless room. It's the only one known to exist. And notice it's a double exposure. We don't ever see those these days, do we? <laughs> anyway, but um, uh, that was taken by a Catholic priest who uh, was aboard for a tour, and he was so excited that he forgot to advance the film. Anyway, this is a uh, mock-up at the British Maritime Museum, and I've noticed that this doesn't look a whole lot like that. This is a picture from the movie. Remember the movie in 1997? We all went to see it, right? The Titanic movie, the Leonard DiCaprio movie. Anyway, does anybody remember this scene? I think not, because it was cut. <laughs> this one ended up on the cutting room floor, but it, it looks to me like it is very authentic. It looks very much like the photographs that I, that I have here of the, of the um, Olympics radio room. Well, okay. We know already that the, uh, that the wireless was, oops, sorry, was profitable in, uh, at maritime, but not on, on shore. The Marconi and Telefunken companies were, were competing against each other. They were rather fierce. In 1912, the ships that had Marconi gear and people couldn't talk to those that had Telefunken gear and vice versa. In fact, they were quite hostile to, to each other. And that, that turned out to be a factor in the, in the Titanic sinking. The radio operators for these companies were employees of the companies, not a part of the ship's crew. And I, as I mentioned before, they, uh, the companies, the uh, shipping companies paid by subscription for news, ice reports, and those kinds of things. I kind of wonder if they were encrypted. I don't know that. But why wouldn't Telefunken be able to listen in on Marconi's broadcast? They were all on the same frequency, right? This is... Uh, uh, in 1912, this is the, um, these were the stations that were set up in Europe by both Marconi and Telefunken to communicate with uh, ships at sea. Uh, the purple ones were Marconi stations. You notice they're mostly in the uh, UK and Ireland. The, uh, the Telefunken had, uh, had a, um, a, a pretty big network ashore in, uh, in the rest of Europe 
The green stations were Marconi stations, but they were operated not by Marconi, but by French Navy people. On the, on the uh, western side of the Atlantic, uh, it was pretty much a uh, Marconi story. They had uh, stations in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and, um, and New York, other stations too, but these are the ones that were, that were players in the Titanic drama. Notice that um, here, MGY. MGY was who? Titanic. These are pictures of some of the radio stations that were ashore on, um, on, in uh, Canada and the United States. Sable Island was, a, was an important one. It's out in the middle of the Atlantic, and, or out uh, in the Atlantic well away from land. What a deserted place it was. Cape Race was an important one in the, uh, in the Titanic drama. Sable Island. And then Seagate and Sag Harbor were on Long Island. This picture shows David Sarnoff. Does anybody know who David Sarnoff was? That's right. Well, here he was a kid, and I believe this picture was taken when he was operating, uh, listening uh, uh, for the Titanic uh, uh, um, operations after the ship sank and all the survivors were, what are those called, recovery operations? He was operating, I think, from Sag Harbor. Uh, but uh, he listened to the whole uh, Titanic drama from a radio station at the top of a uh, department store in New York City. This, is, this map is a, uh, shows the, the stations that were both ashore and afloat that were, that were involved or near the Titanic when she went down right there. The ships that we are going to be interested in most are the Californian, she was the closest, and the Carpathia that was only 58 miles away. Notice that Titanic's sister ship was um, uh, 500 miles away. And those of you who, who listened to that uh, or watched that video that I recommended learned that Titanic was, was communicating with Olympic during this whole drama. Olympic was just too far away to help. The ship that was closest was the Californian. She was a freighter that was designed to carry passengers. She didn't have any aboard at the time. She was British. She was headed to uh, Boston from London. She sighted the, um, um, she sighted the iceberg sometime in the evening, and at 20, about 22.30 that evening, there, uh, she found herself in, in an ice field, and the captain decided to just stop for the night. Rather than pl or drive on and plow into an iceberg, he decided to stop and just float until the sun came up, and then he'd be able to see where he was going. At about um, uh, 2310, the bridge watch sighted Titanic as she went by, going high speed through the ice field. A uh, Marconi um, operator aboard the Californian, whose name was Evans, sent uh, warning at the captain's uh, uh, order. He sent warnings of the ice uh, out by wireless. But this transmission being very close to Titanic, only about 20 miles, this was received by Titanic's radio operator who was busy trying to get messages from Cape Race. The uh, Californian signal was so loud that he couldn't copy Cape Race. This is what we call today what? QRM. That's it. This is a QRM story in part. Anyway, so as you saw in the movie, a Titanic operator, uh, Barconi operator Phillips, was angry and he, he, he sent to the Californian Shut up, shut up, I am busy, I am working Cape Race. So here this guy on the Californian was trying to warn, warn all ships of the, uh, of the ice, and this guy is busy making money for his company, receiving health and welfare 
or uh, uh, greetings. Um, Aunt Martha says hello uh, to, uh, to passengers on the uh, Titanic. That was, that was a, an important money-making reason that the Marconi people were aboard in the first place. Well, I will talk a little bit more about the California, but I did want to uh, let you know that the U-boat pranged her too <laughs> in 1950. These were the Titanic wireless heroes. Uh, Operator Phillips was the one who, uh, who said, I am busy. Uh, he was assisted by Harold Bride. Bride survived the sinking, barely. Phillips uh, made it to a boat, but, uh, but died of, um, of um, um, what was it, um, hypothermia. And uh, uh, Captain Smith didn't make it either. This is an example of a chit, a, um, a little form that Marconi used. The Marconi operators would fill it out here, and the, the uh, message text would they filled out here. This one, this one was addressed to CQ, to everybody. CQD, what does that mean? CQ distress. I'm in distress. CQD, require assistance, position 4146 North, 5014 West, struck iceberg, Titanic. Arg. The next ship, uh, the, the next closest ship to the uh, Titanic was Carpathia. Carpathia was, a, was actually a Royal Mail ship liner, an older one. She was, um, she, was, uh, uh, she was able to hear the, uh, the Titanic's distress signal. The operator uh, got the attention of the captain. The Carpathia uh, made for the, the Titanic, but she was about four hours away. Oh, and by the way, guess what? Carpathia was praying by U-boat too in World War I. The, um, this, these are pictures of the, uh, of, of taken from Carpathia showing the, uh, the uh, survivors uh, still in the, in the boats. And then once on deck, uh, they came aboard with whatever they were wearing in the water, and it was all wet and cold. The passengers aboard the Carpathia generously offered them coats and blankets. These people had to sit on deck because the ship was full already and uh, the uh, Carpathia headed for New York City. Here's um, um, the uh, Titanic radio operator uh, Bride being uh, assisted off the, uh, off the ship, off the Carpathia, and there was her Marconi guy. These guys spent, Bride, even with his frostbitten feet, helped uh, the uh, Marconi operator on, uh, on Carpathia send tons and tons and tons of messages um, uh, from the uh, from the Titanic survivors, these two resisted bribes that were sent in plain language from the uh, from uh, newspaper reporters in New York and other places, offering them big money for scoops. But they resisted, and uh, I think that reflected really well on them. Anyway. There were other ships that uh, there in the area that were able to recover the bodies. Uh, hmm, not all of them were, uh, were recognizable when they were fished out of the water. Uh, some were returned to families. Uh, others were buried in uh, two cemeteries in, Fa in uh, Halifax where you can, you can visit them today. Who's been to Halifax? Anybody seen those, that cemetery? Well, after the, the whole thing was over, the questions were naturally asked, what went wrong? Well, obviously a lot did, because a lot of people died. Well, um, first of all, there were no wireless regulations in use at the time. Wireless was still really new, and ships had just been required to get it, mainly because uh, they needed to to enter US ports or they needed to comply with U.S. laws if they were American flagged ships. Well, um, 
after this happened, both the United States, England, and England, and other countries too, uh, saw the need for regulating uh, wireless, and so that started to happen. They began by uh, uh, starting to set up frequency allocations. How could they do that when all the tr transmitters were transmitting on the same frequency? I believe this took time and a lot of political effort to get, get this uh, taken care of. Also, there was a trend toward using higher frequencies. I think the amateurs led the way on that. Is that true, everyone? Also, we already said that uh, Marconi and Telefunken didn't love each other very much and didn't cooperate at all. Well, now they had to. This, was, uh, this began to be a, uh, a legal requirement. And they, I'm sure the company saw the, uh, the need for it, especially in emergency situations. What else happened that went wrong? Well, other ships didn't hear the SOS, particularly the Californian. The Californian's ca captain was really crucified when he got back to Boston. Uh, he was the scapegoat of, of, of why there weren't more living survivors of the uh, Titanic. I uh, encourage you to look into that yourself and f figure out the justice of that. Anyway, um, the U.S. Congress passed the Radio Act of 1912, requiring uh, passenger ships to have uh, uh, radio operators on duty 24 hours a day, every day. Just like they do now, right? Or at least Navy ships. Anyway, um, Internal communications between the, the radio uh, shack and the bridge were required. Passengers, passenger ships had to be uh, in contact with other ships or shore stations all the time. We all know the Q signals, right? We know some of them, right? <laughs> um, wireless equipment had to have a backup power source, and rocket flares were intent were required for distress use only. The Titanic, in her distress, fired red rocket signals. These were seen aboard the Californian. Why didn't the Californian start up her engines and head over there? Well, that was one of the reasons the captain was crucified. But anyway, the, um, um, th that was another thing that came out of all this. There was still more that, that uh, went wrong and, uh, and began to be addressed. Lifeboats. The Titanic went to sea with, with a, um, an adequate number of life, lifeboats and life rafts to meet requirements, to meet the, re the, the, the royal mail service requirements. But they were not adequate for the number of people who were aboard. Less than half, there were less than half uh, berths aboard lifeboats for the number of people aboard. So uh, that had to change. Oh, sorry. Crews had to be trained. They had to have lifeboat drills. Who's, who here has been on a, 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 a cruise? Modern, did you have uh, lifeboat assignments? Did you have a drill? Well, Thank the dead Titanic passengers. What else went wrong? Well, how about that ice field that all these ships were, were floundering around in? In 1912, the U.S. Navy got the job to begin an ice patrol and, and send out reports of ice without cost and, and without encryption so that they, the, all users, all the ships at sea, could get reports of the ice and other hazards. In 1916, the U.S. Coast Guard was formed to take over that job. What started in 1916 for the United States? World War I, right? 17, but we were, um, we were spinning down the vortex, right? Because uh, Lusitania was sunk. And anyway, so the Navy was going to be busy. So the ice patrol is, uh, I, I, 
I don't think it's operating anymore. Now there are much more high-tech means to keep track of uh, sea ice. But in any case, that was uh, one of the things that got fixed. Disasters at sea. Did this ever happen again? Oh, well, yeah. Lot of times. Starting not even all that long after the Titanic went to, went to the bottom. And this one was just about as bad. This was the British liner RMS Empress of Ireland. She was getting underway from Canada and was out in the St. Lawrence Seaway. And in the dense fog, she was moving right along, and all of a sudden, out of the fog comes a Norwegian freighter and smashes right into her side. Same story as before, right? Anyway, this ship sank very fast. She went down in about 15 minutes. The passengers inside, lots of them, had no chance. She still managed to get off a distress signal, so wireless played a small role. Two ships came out to uh, look for survivors and actually pick some up. The, uh, the Norwegian freighter that bumped into her, it stayed on scene too and helped rescue survivors. Otherwise, these people were out in cold water and in the absolute darkness, and otherwise they didn't have a chance. So wireless did play a role in helping some of the people survived from the Empress of Ireland. Did it happen again? Didn't take long. This was the Titanic's sister ship, her younger sister, the Britannic. Britannic was being built when Titanic went to the bottom. So the engineers that were building her put, uh, put some improvements into her to make, uh, to make up for some of the deficiencies that were recognized in the Titanic. Did it help? No. The, um, the uh, Britannic hit a mine that had been laid by a German submarine. Anyway, and, um, and she sank, I think it took um, between half hour and, a, and an hour for this ship to go down. Only four compartments were flooded, but this ship was a hospital ship at that time. She wasn't full of patients. She had some aboard, and there were a lot of nurses and doctors. And those nurses took pity on the poor, poor wounded guys that were in the, in the hospital ship and left portholes open all over the place for ventilation. So when the ship got, got low in the water, guess where the water came in? Through portholes. The ship lost, lost uh, buoyancy and went down. This wreck is in not very deep water, and if you look her up on the internet, you'll find images of her wreck on the bottom line on her side. Did it happen again? Well, of course, lots of times. This is one that happened in 1956. I was, um, hmm, what, 10 years old when this happened? And I remember the news, uh, this ship and the, uh, and the ship that bumped into her, this was the Stockholm, a, a, a Swedish freighter. This sh uh, ship was full of, um, of passengers. She was an Italian liner. She took a long time to sink. And because she did, and because there was so much uh, radio uh, communication assets on scene, there was a huge rescue effort mounted, and not very many people were lost, relatively speaking, not, not compared to the Titanic or the Empress of Ireland. And does it still happen? Yes. You all remember this. This was only seven years ago. This was the Costa Concordia. What happened to her? Yes. Yes, her, her captain, showing off, ran his ship a little, too close to an under, underwater rock that he didn't know about, and it ripped open her side. And guess what happened? Same thing has happened to the Titanic. She rolled, she filled up with water. She, fortunately, she was in shallow water, and this is how she came to rest. But there were still a, a bunch of people that were lost, 36 people killed in this. The ship was a total loss. Moreover, it took a huge and expensive salvage operation to get her up off the rocks without spilling oil all over the place. 
in a resort area. And so as a result, this, this was a hugely expensive thing. And the ship was lost anyway. Could have gone to the bottom out in the middle of the Atlantic. Well, what about the people that went down with the Titanic? They came from all compartments, all walks of life. The captain, of course, Captain Smith, there were the ship's officers, oops. The ship's officers, pretty brave. A lot of them knew they weren't gonna make it off the ship, but they did their best to make sure that the women and children went first. Where do you think that came from? Women and children first? Remember that slide I showed you of that French liner, the La Bourgogne? On that ship, it was women and children last. There were over 300 women on that ship, and only one was rescued. Only one. And no children. Of all the children that were aboard, none of them survived. So women and children first, was the motto on the, on the Titanic, and, and, a, and these guys were the first to pay. But there were others too. This was a stoker on the ship. One of the guys <laughs> shoveling coal down in the bowels. Those guys did a heroic job. As one of our uh, net members on uh, the powwow net pointed out, you know, those guys stayed at their shovels. So the fires kept burning and the, uh, and the generators kept running and the lights stayed on so that all those people topside trying to get into lifeboats had lights. This is a Catholic priest who comforted those who knew they were going down with the ship. They knew they were going swimming or just going down with the ship. This guy stayed with the ship. He was one of those many heroes on the ship that, that knew he was a goner and, and stayed at his, uh, at his job, his, his calling, until the end. But there were others too, like the big big deal businessman here. How about this guy, the young adventurer? These people, the older couple, on a, um, on a trip to America, maybe they were coming back from Europe. These people were among the richest people in the world. She could have gotten into a lifeboat, but she stayed with him. This young lady, who knows who she was? This gal, I would imagine that she was. She got on in Ireland. She was looking for a new life in America. She was uh, down in third class or maybe second. Unfortunately, she didn't make it. But who was the most famous survivor of the of the Titanic? It was this grand lady. This lady was in a lifeboat, and there are all kinds of stories about how heroic she was. And when she, uh, she was a, uh, actually a, a, a grand lady in New York society. She was a philanthropist. She was active in all kinds of worthy causes, women's rights, uh, uh, children's education, literacy, children's literacy, and after World War I, she became a, uh, a stalwart in, the, in, in a, a charity effort to rebuild those French villages and places that had been destroyed in World War I. She was a great lady. She, after, long after she was dead, she became the subject of a Broadway musical. Everybody, anybody know what the name of that was? Unsinkable Molly Brown. She was never known as Molly. Her friends called her Maggie. Anyway, that, that musical became a, um, a motion picture in, in 1956 or so. Anyway, the unsinkable Molly Brown, that's who she was. Well, now I'm done, but, but I'd like to leave you with uh, a couple of things, a couple of uh, more homework items to do. These, uh, I, I've watched this movie, and, and I didn't watch it closely enough at the time. I need to watch it again. And I think maybe it would be worth doing for all of us. This, this has a, um, a syrupy love story in it.
but the Titanic was real, and the disaster was real. Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. Anyway, and this is a book I read when I was in high school, A Night to Remember by Walter Lord, and it's still the book to read on the Titanic disaster. The uh, Fairfax, Fairfax County Library has it. Please, when you have a chance, pick up this book and read it. It's very good. Well, Mr. President, that's it for me. I hope. You can imagine that there were investigations upon investigations upon investigations, and all these Marconi chits were rounded up and looked at. That wasn't the case with the, uh, the, the La Bourgogne. The French government covered that baby up completely. It got all those French sailors onto a, on a French ship and took them back to France and never let them see the light of day again. That was a that was a disgusting and disgraceful story. Read about it. Sir. Um, when the rescue ships came to rescue some of these disasters we talked about, how did they find their way to where the accident was? Would you repeat your question so people at home can hear it? Okay. Um, the question was, how did the rescue ships find, find where the... Uh, the uh, ships went down. I think that's a real good question because in the dark, the ocean doesn't look much different. It, sir? Well, if the ship is already sunk, there might be flares on the lifeboats. See, there might be flares on the lifeboats. But shooting, you only have so many on the lifeboat. So when do you shoot the flare? If you're the captain of the lifeboat, when do you start shooting the flares? What if you don't see the lights of the ships coming? What if you're out there for hours or even days? Do you, do you want to die of starvation and still have flares in your, in your flare gun? No. But do you want to shoot all your flares and nobody comes? Then what? Shooting the flares becomes a real, a real gutty, gutsy decision, sir. You said that, that they made a change that flares would only be used for disasters. Before, and were they used for celebrations or something before well, that, or what? Well, uh, Paul's account, uh, Paul found a, a source that said that on the Californian. The, uh, the flares, the, they thought the flares were being fired by the Titanic in celebration of the Titanic's maiden voyage. That sounds pretty weak to me. Uh, I, I didn't find that reference, but uh, Paul did, and Paul did a lot more uh, research on this than I did. So, yes, yes, sir. <coughs> a couple comments. One is that uh, uh, Molly Brown was also the name of uh, one of the Gemini castles, the one that was captained by the uh, by Alan Shepard, whose uh, Mercury castle had sunk. Oh, uh, <laughs> and also uh, a night to remember was made, also made into a movie. Oh, and that's the, right. And the uh, Morse code in that is quite accurate. So Morse code in the Titanic movie '97 uh, is complete gibberish. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Well. Most people don't read Morse at 30 minute, words a minute, right? <laughs> or maybe it wasn't that fast, but but uh, I, I, I don't doubt it at all. Thank you. Sir, anybody, another question? Yes, question. Um, I think you might have already answered it with about the flares, but they said it was a specified for emergency use only. Were they ever used for regular? Well, I think this came out of the, the, uh, the Radio Act of 1912 or some, or some associated legislation that it became a requirement after the, after the, the Titanic disaster. Yes, Lee. I mean, Titanic sent her light and longitude, so the other ships knew 
where she was. They and they were heading one. toward that well, point. They sent the wrong one the first time. Yes. Uh, the, the, the statement was that Titanic sent <coughs> her own latitude and longitude, as we saw in that, uh, in that uh, ship from the other ship that received that signal. Yes, she did send her lat launch. Was that accurate? Well, in fact, in, in the movie that you told us to watch, there was a, a later transmission from that Marconi operator that corrected their lat long. Yes. So well, they had a corrected lat that's long. That's right. I'd forgotten. Well, inaccurate latitudes and longitudes have gotten a lot of people not picked up. Yes, David. Having rescued several people from the ocean near darkness, I can tell you that at the time the latitude and longitude were sent, that only gives you a general about 20 mile location where the ship was at some time. In the dark, if the ship was already sunk, it would be very difficult to establish where the survivors were. Well, they didn't, they didn't spot the survivors until daybreak. Okay, and, and David's comment was uh, that, that it's very difficult to find survivors in the dark, even if you know the latitude and longitude, because they may not be exactly there. They may be, hopefully, in, in somewhere within a 20-mile area, 20-mile uh, uh, diameter area, square area, and, uh, and Lee, your clip actually had the guy on the Carpathian who spotted the first lifeboat. You know, daybreak, they were out there looking. And yes. It, it actually references the person who's, who first saw the, the first lifeboat. Yes. So, so Carpathian. The Carpathian spotted the first live lifeboat in, at, after daybreak. Well, she was, she was four hours away starting about, what, midnight? And the, and the Titanic lasted until about 2 a.m. So those survivors were out there for several hours. And the ones that were in the water weren't alive when they were picked up. Kind of a lesson. Who here wants to go on a cruise ship this summer? <laughs> the uh, same people who want to go near a volcano this summer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Take a cruise ship to go visit the volcanoes. Uh, uh, question, please. Uh, Sold. <laughs> yes, Carrie. For those of you interested, there are two that I know of Titanic memorials in Washington. The one is um, Taft, one of Taft's advisors went down, and there's a block of marble, and I'm not exactly sure where it is but that's memorial to him. And the second one is down on the waterfront and they've been talking about moving it. And the, I looked it up last night and I couldn't find any information about whether it's been moved or not, but it's down on the waterfront. It's ironically known as the Titanic Women's Memorial, but it's actually a memorial to the men of the Titanic. <laughs> Um, uh, which was erected by the women of the United States in honor of the men who went down in the, uh, with the Titanic, letting the women and children f go first. In that regard, several years ago, I went down to the Titanic uh, Memorial on the night of April 15th, and the uh, society, which I think is a group of people who are relatives or descendants of people who were either survivors or who were lost, had a, um, a celebration dinner in which they had uh, a, one of the meals prepared by a local hotel from the Titanic, and all the guys showed up in uh, evening coat and tails. Well, there were probably parts of the Titanic that you did not go unless you were wearing evening wear and um, either men or women and uh, there were probably parts of the Titanic that were off limits to those that lived below decks or uh, second and third class passengers this was the era of Downton Abbey for those of you who are familiar with that show so you know what dressing up for dinner is like 
That was yes. a show about dressing for dinner, right? This, this would have been the Edwardian era, is that right? The Edwardian? Sounds anyway, good to me. I, I don't know my royals. Um, no, he died in 1970. Oh, he did in 1970. Okay. Well, uh, other questions, please? Discussion? Contributions? Jack. So, antennas? What do they do? What's that mass thing in the front? So what was the question? Was, what are the antennas that they use? Do you know? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I, I didn't, didn't look that up. Uh, sir? Mark gap, they probably just long wire. Of course they're long wire. Well, I think they were using I'm a cable. There were wires that were stretched from mast to mast. And uh, old, um, old ships of that time had um, had, um, what were they called, uh, cage, wire cages, where they had multiple wires that were on spreaders that, that, so they put a lot of wire into the air for a limited distance between the masts, things like that. The whole, the whole subject of antennas during the Spark Gap era is probably a good one, as is the equipment, the, the transmitters, and even more exotic were the receivers. That's an even more, can you imagine how you, you would develop a receiver with no vacuum tubes? They were coherers, right? Yeah. All coherers. Well, I don't want to try to get into a discussion there. I don't know. Well, let's say, let's say that for here. another discussion. Yeah, let's do that, sir. Coherers were already obsolete by then. They used uh, Galena crystals. Galena crystals. So they used crystal radios for reception. Everybody, anybody here ever uh, played with crystal radios? Can you imagine depending on something like that for? Sending. Sometimes it would burn out the Galena. And that's called a rock crusher. Because we had a signal like a rock crusher. They carry a couple of those. With them. Oh, okay. Well, uh, uh, Ron said that uh, if the ships were uh, particularly close together, the, the power of the signals could uh, could destroy the crystals in the receiving units, and that's where the term rock crusher came from. Anybody anybody ever use that on the air? Anybody know who's got a rock crushing signal? <laughs> Yeah, AE4R has one on 10 meter net on Thursday nights. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, another question? Questions? Comments? Well, before we finish up, the, the, someone reminded me that for those of you who weren't on the 10 meter net last night, Carrie gave us very interesting information about radio this weekend. There's going to be an exciting event. You want to tell us about the the reason why we won't be able to do any HF work this weekend? <laughs> well, it's partially me and partially Nancy. Um, the, there's a, a prediction that the K index is going to go to 6 uh, tomorrow. So uh, that, that'll take care of most of the... If that actually happens, it'll take care of the, uh, the um, ionosphere uh, as far as being uh, good for... for um, Communications and Nancy, you want to talk about the aurora? According to the uh, University of Alaska Geophysical Institute, I think the aurora um, has a higher possibility of being seen farther south. I think it was going to be possibly visible low on the horizon if you were in Annapolis or farther north. So, everyone, get in your car and go a little farther north. AE4R. So since there's not going to be any HF communication, you can all go work at Winterfest and you won't be missing a thing. <laughs> Thanks, uh, uh, Carrie and Nancy. Uh, by the way, uh, they, they just provided really great advertising for the 10 meter net. Those of you who are regular check-ins, uh, I'm sure look forward to ha Carrie's and uh, Nancy's um, comments on the, um, on the electromagnetic phenomena that uh, affect our HF comms. And if you haven't tuned in, uh, find a way to at least listen because uh, I, I look forward to hearing their comments every week. And it's one of the one of the benefits and delights of being that control. So, so please, if you haven't tuned in, it's 28.444 megahertz 
on Thursday night at 8.30 p.m., world's most boring radio net. Well, that says a lot about what your life must be like if that's what you look forward to. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, I couldn't help that. Well, there's a hand over here somewhere. Sort of the, the small guys, sort of medium-sized stations were pretty much a half kilowatt. How big was the uh, the uh, Titanic system? Because I know four or five kilowatts was not unusual. Uh, the, the question was uh, how big in terms of uh, power output was the Titanic's radio station? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. You can probably find out online. And if you visit the Royal Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England, is it in Greenwich? It's over in England somewhere. I'm sure you'll see it, you'll find out. But it's probably online. Uh, that kind of information would have to be online. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Question? Well, okay, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, thanks to Mike. <laughs> thanks to Thor and Leon and Mike uh, HZ and everybody else that's doing the and, and Lee and everybody that's working on Winterfest and er everybody be sure and help and thank K4YMA for his work on food tonight and uh, we'll see you all in a couple of weeks and by the way I'll make an announcement now the meeting venue is going to be back at Vienna Elementary School due to a problem scheduling it here so the next meeting will be at Vienna Elementary School <laughs>